Welcome everybody. I am pleased to hand over to Professor Kevin Featherstone to start the event. Welcome. My name is Kevin Featherstone and I'll be chairing today's uh, event. Today's discussion is hosted by the Hellenic Observatory here at the London School of Economics and it's part of the LSE's public event series, COVID-19, The Policy Response. The pandemic, of course, has changed our lives. Our governments are struggling to cope with it. What do we expect from our governments in a pandemic and beyond? What do they expect of us? Governments across Europe seem to have adopted different strategies. Some went for early and strict lockdowns, Others relied more on the self-responsibility of its citizens. Some issued tough laws with almost immediate effects and severe penalties. Others followed behavioral signs on how to persuade their citizens to behave in the desired fashion. Almost all governments said they were, they were following the signs. But what signs exactly? COVID-19 has many known unknowns and perhaps unknown unknowns also. And what actually had the primacy, politics or science? With the confusion of the pandemic strategies, are our expectations of government changing? Some governments appear to have had more success than others. Our understanding of government effectiveness and the quality of institutions across Europe seems to be challenged by how our national governments have actually performed. As we plan for the pandemic, our expectations of what governments should do also seem to be changing. Governments have cast aside fiscal discipline and are busy spending to reflate their economies. Keynes seems to be back in fashion, at least for the moment. We want our governments to act boldly and the EU once again seems to be at a crossroads. Chancellor Merkel, President Macron, and the EU Commission propose a recovery fund. By contrast, the so-called frugal four of EU member states are attempting to halt such grandiose plans or to revise them significantly. So the pandemic is raising new questions about governance and citizenship. And we're here to consider how much of a change we might actually be living through. I'm delighted to welcome our expert panel with three distinguished speakers, and I'm pleased to say three friends. They can guide us through these complex uh, questions as we look forward. Let me introduce them in the sequence that they will be speaking to us. Yorgos Yera Petritis is Minister of State of the uh, Hellenic Republic and Professor of Constitutional Law at the University of Athens. He's the author of a recent book with Oxford University Press on the new economic constitutionalism, exploring how economies had been, how economics had been elevated in our European governance before the pandemic. And we can consider the implications of EU governance going forward with him. Bo Rothstein is the August Roos Chair in Political Science at the University of Gothenburg, previously at the University of Oxford. He is very well known for his studies on the quality of governance, how the quality of domestic institutions matters for policy delivery. Last but certainly not least, Amy Verdun is Professor in European Politics and Political Economy at Leiden University in the Netherlands. She's a leading scholar on the politics of the European Union and indeed on governance in the Eurozone. Recently, she has written about how the EU is responding to the COVID-19 pandemic. I'm going to invite each of our panelists to start off with short kickstart presentations. We'll then have a discussion and I'll open the floor to a Q&A. So do please send us your questions. You can do this by using the Q&A uh, facility at the bottom of your Zoom uh, screens. Please tell us who you are and why not tell us where you're asking your questions uh, from, where you are, who you are and where you are. We'd be interested to know. On Facebook, if you're watching through Facebook, you can send us your questions as comments and they will be relayed to me. We'd also like to invite your comments via Twitter 
and the suggested hashtag is hashtag LEC COVID-19. Today's discussion will be recorded and we hope to make it available as, as a podcast to be downloaded uh, shortly. So let's begin. Greece seems to have managed the crisis very well. Yorgos Gerapetritis is at the center of the Greek government. So, George, I wonder if you could tell us why you think you've been successful and what you think the legacies of your uh, successful management might be. George. Thank you, Kevin. It's a great pleasure and honor to be here with you today um, to share my opinion with you, uh, with the distinguished members of the panel. Um, and it's always, I'm always delighted to be uh, among my uh, friends with um, the um, Hellenic Observatory of the LSC. So I think there are three grounds uh, why the uh, Greek government managed to uh, uh, successfully handled the tremendous uh, crisis um, that has erupted uh, over the pandemic. The first is cognitive adherence, the second is social cohesion, and the third is the institutional aspect, which is the uh, smart state. First of all, cognitive adherence. Um, the truth is that the main policy choice that the government made uh, was to attribute health uh, the overriding value of uh, the crisis. So um, in response to what comes first uh, over the pandemic, the response of the Greek government uh, was human life at the expense of other stakes, including the uh, financial aspect. Uh, indeed, there has been a, a huge problem with the uh, financial situation in Greece and elsewhere. Uh, yet, it was uh, our firm belief from the first um, instance that uh, we need, first of all, to safeguard uh, people uh, and their uh, lives. After having established this, um, we uh, introduced uh, a wide committee of all the epidemiologists in Greece, um, so 28 uh, professors uh, of all Greek universities, uh, which were focusing on the pandemic aspect. Um, and then we strictly adhered by their uh, guidance throughout the four months of the uh, health crisis. Um, so essentially what we did was first of all, to strictly follow the recommendation concerning the restrictive measures uh, upon the citizens. That's why we had a very early reaction to the uh, pandemic. We had an early uh, shutdown of uh, schools, of the markets, uh, essentially of the uh, most aspects of, of financial and social life. And eventually we had an early lockdown of the um, society. At the same time, uh, we started relatively early to strengthen the uh, health system, the public health system in uh, Greece, which the truth is was not at its best uh, in the beginning of the uh, crisis. Um, that concerned both the medical supplies um, and the um, upgrade of the health service, especially the intensive uh, care units, uh, because essentially it was uh, the uh, um, the intense health uh, care system that matter um, in the uh, face of the crisis. This early uh, move uh, was absolutely essential because um, in the course of the crisis, it became extremely difficult to actually uh, come up with uh, health supplies because there was a huge competition for the same um, uh, material. And uh, there was not only an entrepreneurial uh, fight, but also a huge diplomatic war concerning uh, those uh, materials. Um, so uh, we managed um, as of February uh, to essentially double the capacity of the health system uh, concerning uh, intense care units. Uh, from about 550 uh, healthcare units to make it about 1,100. Uh, 
in order to accommodate uh, the uh, uh, the problems coming up over the pandemic. All these are accompanied by a very professional contact tracing system. Uh, we used our experts, um, and the truth is we had a, a very wide uh, human network uh, that were absolutely specialized in uh, contract tracing. Uh, we introduced a mechanism of, of tracing from the early um, time of the uh, pandemic. Uh, the truth is that as early, uh, the, the earliest the contract tracing system operates, the better it is for um, the state to try and curb the um, pandemic. So uh, a very professional and well-trained uh, well contact tracing system. Second aspect, the social cohesion. Uh, Kevin rightly said about the self-responsibility, but self-responsibility um, is not always uh, easy to achieve. Indeed, in Greece, we managed to have a, a very high level of social compliance. Um, unexpectedly, I would, I would uh, say, uh, I think uh, this was mostly because of the very wide publicity uh, we made concerning the dangers of the pandemic and the measures that ought to have been taken in order to treat uh, the pandemic. But on the other hand, what was really essential, I think, was that we had a, a daily press conference at a set time, uh, six o'clock in the afternoon. Um, we had a press conference with our uh, chief epidemiologist um, and uh, our chief politician concerning the uh, civil protection. Uh, indeed, it was very interesting also as a political experiment because um, we had a tremendous success concerning um, this broadcasting. Uh, more than 50% of the Greek population were on their TVs at the time of, of this uh, screening. Everybody was expecting um, to watch this conference, this uh, press conference. Um, and everybody was actually discussing about this. Yeah, it was a presentation of, of the daily data concerning the uh, pandemic, but also Every single day, uh, there was uh, a Q&A uh, coming not only from uh, the press, but also from the citizens. And there was a special topic daily concerning a particular aspect of the uh, pandemic. Um, on the top of this, we had regular uh, announcements made by the prime minister himself. Uh, the truth is that the prime minister took over to communicate the message, both in terms of self-responsibility and in terms of the um, state activity. So, the Prime Minister uh, was always there, uh, and um, according to all data, uh, that was a major aspect of the success. Further, concerning the social cohesion issue, I have to stress the point that there was a tremendous um, collaboration between the state and, uh, and the private um, actors. Um, there were huge state-private partnerships um, that ca came not only uh, from the uh, medical market, essentially what happened was under a state umbrella, both private and public um, medical uh, healthcare systems uh, were um, introduced. So we had a single unit uh, to provide health uh, in Greece. Uh, and on the top of this, we had a tremendous uh, level of donations. Um, we managed to mobilize uh, the, not only the um, wealthy people and uh, institutions of Greece, but we made a, a worldwide campaign uh, of Greeks all around the world. And uh, eventually we had uh, an amazing 100 million euros of uh, private donations, especially for the treatment of the uh, pandemic. Finally, last but not least, the uh, state reaction, the smart state. The truth is that as soon as the new government took over in um, uh, July 19, uh, the first law that was passed from the parliament, Kevin uh, has a uh, wide knowledge of this, the first law uh, concerned uh, a new form of government, um, which we call an executive smart state governance. Um, that uh, system introduced a very centralized system of uh, decision making, a top down uh, policy making uh, system. Uh, we introduced at our very early stages uh, 
uh, a central digital system of uh, surveillance and coordination of the governmental action. Um, essentially, we switched the model of Greek government, which was traditionally beset by a bottom-up system of politics. The ministers had essentially the strong power to introduce uh, their policies in their respective uh, material um, of uh, ministerial uh, decision making. Uh, instead of this, we reversed the position so as a very central top down uh, policy making uh, was introduced. Now, why this was important in the face of, of, of the facts of the pandemic? Um, it was absolutely essential to have a very strong central coordination. Over the four months of the pandemic, we introduced seven legislative degrees uh, by the government in order to give the uh, legal foundation to what we did in order to treat the pandemic. And uh, also about 500 ministerial decisions uh, two thirds of them uh, were essentially joint ministerial decisions on many occasions um, of more than five and or eight ministers. So it took a tremendous coordination in order to uh, have a very uh, immediate rapid reaction to what was happening. Uh, because uh, in fact, uh, here at the presidency of, of the government, we received data twice a day by our epidemiologists and we reacted immediately on the basis of this data. Uh, it was a very technocratic model of uh, governance. So in order to introduce these ministerial decisions, it would be absolutely impossible to have a, a quick reaction um, if it wasn't for a centralized um, uh, style of uh, governance. Uh, average of four, uh, joint ministerial decisions on any aspect, financial, social, medical, of the pandemic were introduced uh, over the crisis. And finally, in the course of the smart state, uh, we placed huge emphasis on our digital transformation. Uh, as you probably know, uh, Greece was not famous for uh, the digital uh, performance, yet uh, we managed to introduce a series of, of digital tools that were um, essentially in our political agenda for the next year. We managed to introduce them as early as March and April. Uh, that was of huge importance for the success of the experiment because in this way, we managed to uh, secure social distancing uh, because what happened was that uh, education was provided digitally uh, and distantly. Uh, throughout the pandemic, um, uh, the schools operated uh, promptly and throughout the crisis distantly through um, teleconferences and real-time uh, teaching. Uh, administrative services were essentially provided um, distantly as well. Uh, and of course, we had a, a very unique uh, success in introducing the system of um, exceptional circulation uh, of, uh, in the cities. Uh, as you probably know, after the lockdown, there was an overall prohibition in principle to circulate freely uh, in the cities. Uh, there were only specific grounds upon which one could actually circulate. Uh, in order for anyone to be out of um, the house, um, they needed to send an SMS to a central digital mechanism in uh, Greece uh, and to indicate the uh, personal data, the address, the um, destination place and the ground why they were moving. Uh, interestingly, in 42 days of the uh, lockdown, 110 million SMS were sent to the uh, Ministry of, of Digital Transformation, an average of 2.6 million SMS uh, per day. Um, further, uh, we replaced the physical interaction of citizens with the state with new uh, electronic digital uh, models. For example, we introduced a system of medical prescriptions uh, that were set digitally. Two million uh, uh, medical prescriptions were essentially uh, sent digitally. Uh, 
uh, 700,000 uh, state cert certificates were issued in the four uh, months. And uh, further, uh, we introduced very early in the pandemic a single um, digital gate uh, for the government, gov.gr. Uh, uh, and we have there 5 million unique visits. An amazing, I think, digital transformation of the state, which was uh, really uh, made very promptly. Now, um, as for the legacy, I think there are two uh, main ways why we need to be uh, happy and we must be proud of what we have achieved. First, because contrary to all uh, stereotypes, um, we proved that we can have an effective state, uh, both in terms of uh, structures and uh, services, uh, and of course the digitalization of the state, which was a a major uh, issue for the country. Uh, now that we're opening to tourism as of um, July 1st, tomorrow, um, I think it's important that we show to the world that we can uh, also be very um, strong and powerful and coherent in terms of the state services, uh, because people need to feel that they're safe when they're coming to Greece. Now, the second stereotype that we managed to uh, combat um, was that we Greeks can um, obey to the rules. Um, there was a tremendous uh, layer of regular obedience to the uh, state rules. Um, I think that was made possible basically because people were actually convinced uh, by the technocrats um, that the right thing was made throughout the crisis. There was a new and solid uh, level of trust between the state and the society. Uh, in theory, one could say um, of a new type of, of democratic legitimacy and output uh, legitimacy, which is based not only on uh, democratic processes, but also on the effectiveness of, of the state to immediately respond to uh, the needs of the uh, society. I think it is very important, uh, concluding uh, Kevin, to indicate that in spite of, of the problems, we didn't encounter any problems of democratic deterioration. Um, that we unfortunately saw in other uh, European states. The parliament, the Greek parliament, remained in session throughout uh, the pandemic. Um, there were um, legislative decrees and laws coming to the parliament every single day. The parliament, of course, operated with a limited number of uh, parliamentarians, but everybody could rotate in order to effectively participate in the parliamentary um, sessions. It is important that all the executive acts that were introduced were eventually um, uh, set to the parliament very, very promptly. The constitution provides that there is an exceptional legislative power to the government to introduce emergency measures. It happens to all constitutions throughout the world. Um, our constitution gave us the possibility to introduce such measures. We did, or we introduced seven such um, degrees, but instead of 40 days that we had the time, uh, the deadline to um, actually uh, subject them to a parliament, um, we only had a, uh, an average of 17 days. 17 days after the uh, enactment of the decrees, we introduced them to the parliament. And um, although the constitution provides for a four month period in order to um, actually have them passed by the parliament, uh, we managed an amazing 11 days um, of uh, passage through the parliament of all these uh, decrees. So respecting the rule of law, or the rule of law and respecting the parliamentary um, uh, democracy now allow us to speak of a legacy that um, is essentially beset by a new, type, a new type of modern digital governance, a governance that is not only uh, based on the fiscal discipline that we uh, proved to be quite efficient in the last um, 10 years, but also on a new type of social understanding uh, based on the obedience and the conviction that uh, both uh, politicians and technocrats can work together in order to produce maximum um, results. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you, George, very much indeed. That's very clear and very informative. So we have a case here.
in which uh, perhaps traditionally there is uh, certain stereotypes about uh, how government operates uh, in Greece, how citizens uh, relate to, uh, to power. But we have a case here which uh, has clearly been very successful, uh, the smart state uh, notion uh, with innovations uh, digitally uh, and uh, communications uh, that are being watched by 50% of Greeks every night. Uh, if only all professors could have such uh, TV uh, impact. But we have then an insight from the very center of government uh, in Athens as to how they've been successful. Let me pass to Professor Bo Rothstein. Now, Bo has uh, looked at the patterns of government across the world, uh, including uh, in Europe. And Bo, I wonder if you could give us your thoughts about how different European governments have handled the crisis and what are the lessons here when we think in terms of government effectiveness? Over to you, Bo. Have we have we lost uh, both of us then? Uh, perhaps we uh, perhaps we have. Okay, let's um, move to our uh, next speaker uh, and to take the European uh, angle. We've seen in recent days uh, and weeks, Amy, a kind of existential moment for the European uh, Union. The European Union debating what its purpose is, uh, notions of solidarity uh, and notions of helping those uh, governments most in need. The European Union is said to be once again at some kind of uh, crossroads. But even at the national level, as I mentioned in the, in the introduction, governments seem to be um, shifting their economic policies. Keynes or Keynesianism seems to be um, less out of fashion than previously. Amy, I wonder if you'd like to uh, give us your thoughts as to what kind of changes we might be uh, living through in terms of governance, national and European. Thank you, Kevin. So I'm very pleased to be part of this panel today and delighted to speak about these topics. And I was listening to our previous speaker and uh, thinking about my experience in the Netherlands, uh, Kevin has asked me to speak about the EU component, which I will do. But if in the question and answer, there seems to be a good reason to juxtapose the Greek and the Dutch situation, I would be very happy to speak to that too. Now on the matter of the uh, EU and the impact of the Corona crisis on the EU, I've just prepared like few slides and there are more speaking points than a proper uh, slides with graphs. I felt if I spoke for 10 minutes with lots of graphs, I could probably go on for a very long time. But what I have in my first slide is uh, to speak a bit about the question that was asked to me. Uh, will the pandemic have lasting impact on what European publics expect of their governments? And in this context, I took the trouble to look a little bit at the uh, Eurobarometer. The European Parliament has been putting out Eurobarometer statistics weekly about the way that citizens across the EU perceive their governments. And I think what we see from those statistics is that the citizens have started to feel much more strongly about the need of a strong government. We saw in the previous speaker's presentation that the relationship between Greek citizens and its state has probably strengthened. The evidence provided I thought was very compelling, but we see this also in the perceived notions by citizens about what they want their governments to do. And this is an interesting point because as, we've going, uh, as we go back 10 years to the previous crisis and looking forward to the end of that moment and what we are in the EU crisis today, the question has been, what is the strategy to move forward when a major crisis like this uh, comes up? It, it raises issues of questions about government and opposition. So yesterday I had the privilege of speaking to a, a political representative of the uh, British Embassy in the Netherlands. And we were talking about how the UK versus the Netherlands dealt with the pandemic 
and to what extent uh, opposition forces, but also forces of the media, speak to the government. We just saw about how the Greek government dealt with it, where it feels that there's a lot of coherence in the state. The a bit of my presentation on the Netherlands later on in the Q&A will speak to that same topic. In the United Kingdom, we get the impression that there is a bit more, uh, a bit more opposition and the media being quite uh, harsh on how well the government is, is dealing with it. So this, this notion of a, a strong issue coming up and then the response either by uh, opposition in government or different parties of the establishment and how they deal with the question of what the role of the government is. So what we see from the citizens is that really want a strong uh, government to respond to this. Now, another couple of my bullet points speak to these, if we dissect this, speak to the question of uh, independent public media. So as this issue comes up, citizens ask themselves the question, who can we trust? A lot of people like to go to social media. So there's also evidence that just came out the other day suggesting that if you take predominantly your, your messaging from social media, so either a YouTube or uh, Facebook, Twitter, the likelihood of those uh, people feeling that there are some conspiracy theories out there is much higher than those who are taking predominantly their uh, insights from independent public media. So it also gives us an opportunity to say, where do we get our news from? How do we know what really is true? And can we trust our government? Again, we come back to this notion of strong government. If we then come to the point of expertise, and there was again, uh, a previous speaker spoke briefly about expertise and, and our, our host also asks us to think about this. Uh, there's a strong need to re-evaluate re expertise. So there's national expertise that comes out that seems to speak about the COVID crisis as if it's a national pandemic that hits the national country, but where it is, how it's breaking out, in which particular pocket, under which segment. But it's very clear that these issues are all across Europe. In fact, they're all across the globe. In fact, they're a pandemic. And so that a lot of the governments have, have emphasized their very national expertise and speak only in passing of uh, comparisons that we could see across the globe. So uh, in the EU context, which is what I've been asked to speak about, in the EU context, from the very first day, in fact, there was quite strong EU-wide collaboration. It didn't hit the front news of the newspapers, but there had already been exchange of information very much from the very beginning. Now it was up to the national member states to decide what to do with the information, but there was right away an exchange of information. My final point of this, uh, uh, of this slide, the final two points about redistribution and the economic recession. So the, the notion of the crisis on the EU is that this is a health crisis that will have an economic impact. The health part traditionally has been national competence. There is no EU health competence. There is a minor, small component of EU health. It has to do with the single market. So if, if, if elderly or pensioners or, or workers are moving across Europe, they can take their national health insurance with them and get treated in another EU member state. But the, the treaty does not speak about health being EU competence. And this notion of what it does to the EU predominantly focuses on what it will do to the finances, the, the, the wealth and wealth, wealth and health and wealth and health and well-being of the citizens and the single market. Now the question here is will this even have a larger impact on the, the EU more generally? Next slide, please. Now, if we are thinking about uh, the uh, convergence towards a more activist state in the economy, we right away ask ourselves these deeper economic questions. And this is where the EU has, of course, a lot to do. So in our, in our clear EU governance concepts that the EU is involved in, we've been focusing over the last maybe 20, 30 years about trying to find the right balance between, on the one hand, uh, market-oriented uh, coordination and on the other hand some form of state intervention. Now the EU with its single market program has, has sought to move away from state aid and a special treatment of large, large industry or special groups and in favor of a level playing field. But what we're seeing here at this point in a lot of EU member states is the question of what are core industries that may need to be protected are there icons of industry or groups in society that need to be protected? And this seems to be an issue of all across EU member states. 
There's another trend that has been coming up over the last, you know, particularly 10, 15 years that people are se severely worried about is the uh, widening of the gap between rich and poor. And so put those two things together and the citizens are wondering to which extent maybe the EU has led to a bigger difference between rich and poor and moving away from what uh, people like uh, uh, George Ross and Andy Martin have called the, uh, the European social model or the model of society within the context of economic and monetary union. And of course, if one looks at these discussions and Thomas Piketty has spoken about this as well, we are seeing that this is not just a European phenomenon, but a phenomenon across the whole uh, sort of liberal market economy world, but it doesn't lead people to feel that this is a, a model that they think is the right way. So this whole issue of, of the crisis coming in, probably making the more vulnerable, uh, even more vulnerable in a trend that's already taking place, it, it opens a discussion about these core social principles that a lot of members of uh, the a lot of citizens in the EU member states feel strongly about, namely issues about basic income, uh, getting rid of, of poverty or uh, dealing with poverty, dealing with issues of unemployment, which is a legacy from the previous crisis, and the question of what the EU should do on social policy developments. Next slide, please. Now, what may be the longer term impact of the EU? So kind of rules and governance, and is this a transformative moment for the Eurozone? Now, obviously, this is very difficult to see in advance. It's going to be very clear in hindsight. Lots of scholars in five years time will tell you it was all very clear to see. I can tell you right now, it's not very clear at all. But one of the things we can say is that the Corona crisis in the EU coincides with Brexit. Now, we haven't heard much about Brexit, other than living in the UK, you will have, but other people across the EU have not been hearing all that much about Brexit. In part, it's because uh, in the UK, the whole dealing with the crisis, the coronavirus crisis, has put the Brexit issue a bit on the back burner, or at least uh, off the, the main uh, tabloid newspapers. But of course, Brexit is, is having to be dealt with, and we have not heard of a a request for an extension, which means that all of this has to happen within the 12 month period, including ratification and the lawyers are, having their, are up in arms that this is close to impossible to, to take place. So Brexit is very likely to happen, barring some absolute catastrophe I can't even imagine. And if it happens, it is very possible that it will look more like a sort of equivalent of a hard Brexit than a sort of very well managed uh, process. So Brexit is out there and really having an impact on what the EU is all about, the relationship with the UK and restructuring within the EU what it is all about to be the EU without the UK. And this is a very important issue when it comes down to these questions that we are that I was just raising. So we have an opportunity here to make a big step forward towards more solidarity. Now with the UK out and the question of more solidarity, this could very well be a make or break moment. Is the EU going to step up to the plate? The UK, which is one of the member states that traditionally had been more critical about more social policy or a, a stronger involvement of redistribution of the EU. So this is a, is a moment where this, this could happen. So we see, in a sense, a renewed European integration spirit. And uh, Kevin Vendelstone already mentioned this at the very outset, a proposal supported by Merkel and Macron on a recovery fund for the EU, which would put a lot of money into the hands of those who need it in either the form of, of grants and loans. And the, the discussion between Merkel Macron and the Frugal Four is about exactly under what conditions and how do we, how do we get there. Next slide, please. So if we think about all of this together, I would argue that we are indeed at an important turning point. And if it is taken in a proper way that gives a lot of the citizens of the EU a sense of feeling of belonging, that their issues has been have been dealt with, that the member states across the EU feel that the EU is looking out for their interests, then this could very well be a, a turning point uh, in the EU's development. We may see a move from a, a more uh, easy negative integration component to a more positive integration component, but more state activism and more uh, a, a stronger role for the EU for coordination and possibly also redistribution. As I mentioned already before, there was in fact quite a bit of EU involvement in crisis management, not necessarily at the front burner, but we'll see maybe this happening uh, a bit more also as we see research on this topic. We also see the start of a post-UK EU, and so this having this really large crisis 
coincide with this moment where the EU has to rethink what it's all about, given the, the departure of the, of the UK, uh, offers an opportunity for the EU to reinvent itself. So the importance of collaboration in areas of pandemics, health and expertise will also further be integrated into what the EU is all about. Next slide, please. Okay, and that's my that's my final slide. Thank you for your attention. I've put two um, uh, recent publications of mine up here. Anyone who's uh, seeing this on their podcast can can hold it still and and click on that if they so wish. Otherwise, I give the floor back to uh, Professor Featherstone and, and thank you for the opportunity for speaking here today. Thank you, Amy. That's a very nice compliment to what we've uh, heard uh, from George. Uh, I understand both Rothstein, uh, we've lost him uh, through the technical uh, connection. Who said Zoom was so um, liberating in these circumstances? But uh, let's connect what you've both been uh, saying. I guess there's a, some uh, theme here, isn't there, about uh, whether we're li living through something unique because of emergency politics, something about the nature of an emergency which overcomes pre-existing weaknesses, uh, difficulties, uh, legitimizes new kinds of actions, taboos are exploded, uh, et cetera. Picking up a theme that I think you're both uh, very familiar with in your own work, um, I wonder whether the pandemic in encouraging people to think more in terms of experts, science, a kind of cognitive uh, legitimation, as it were. I know that uh, George has uh, spoken in his recent book, uh, written in his recent book, about uh, deliberative uh, democracies and uh, of the importance in the world before the pandemic, the importance that economic governance in the European uh, Union uh, should have a more deliberative, expert orientated um, uh, character to it. So building on what Amy was also saying about a shift, uh, as it were, away from fake news to as listening to uh, scientists and experts, I wonder whether you could both comment on whether you think this is just something unique because of the nature of an emergency, an emergency by definition doesn't last, or whether this is something which might take us towards a more um, experts orientated legitimation, uh, a kind of deliberative uh, process of our democracy, more reflective uh, in that way. I wonder, uh, as you've written about it, George, if I could ask you to start off on that point. Thank you, Gavin. Um, thank you, Amy. Uh, it's been wonderful to hear what um, you mentioned. I fully agree on, on most of it. Um, to tell you the truth, I think that the uh, model is rapidly changing uh, and the new model has come to stay and to survive. Uh, the truth is that throughout Europe, there was um, a wide mistrust uh, concerning what we call technocracy, that is, cognitive knowledge through politics. Um, and um, this was the discussion uh, throughout the life of the European Union. We all know about the classic dilemma uh, concerning the democratic deficit of, of the European Union, which uh, essentially consisted of this type of gray government through comitology, uh, essentially technocracy. Um, in a way, I think that the health crisis has contributed immensely in changing the perception of how cognitive knowledge could operate in uh, politics. Um, the truth is that expert knowledge has always been part of uh, reason, but not always part of politics. Um, and I think we're rapidly moving to a new level of, of governance where um, the scientific knowledge, uh, data-based politics, uh, will be essentially the unique model of um, decision um, making. That's why I mentioned that I feel there is a very rapid transformation from the uh, input legitimacy, the classic process uh, 
democratic legitimacy that everyone of us uh, knows from uh, the academia uh, to a new type of uh, legitimacy, which is uh, ongoing. Um, it's more accountable to people because it's uh, uh, all, uh, at all times uh, in front of the people. So um, a government should, only, should not only be uh, legitimate through the democratic process, but should also be legitimate in terms of uh, the actual successful uh, treatment of hard cases uh, in politics. Um, and I think an important aspect of this is um, the deliberative uh, aspect of uh, democracy. As Kevin mentioned, um, I think the basis for this new model is that we need to be absolutely ready uh, to change our minds about things. Um, I think it is very important to have a, a firm conviction that uh, policy choices uh, are not based on political priorities, but, but must be based on, on uh, technical data. Um, and uh, this is why I think that there is a huge in injection of, of, of uh, cognitive uh, knowledge to the uh, political process. Uh, in my eyes, um, the, um, the new type of, of, of confidence between the state and, and the society is essentially uh, built up through this new uh, form of uh, cognitive knowledge. Um, and I think there is no really way back. Uh, this, however, of course, poses a, a danger to the foundations of uh, democracy because obviously um, the uh, successful treatment of a crisis is not per se uh, an evidence of, of uh, successful democracy. It is necessary to have uh, a cognitive critical mass, uh, but on the other hand, you need to be legitimate in, in taking the decisions. Let's take the examples of uh, Hungary, which is not the best example in Europe, where um, there was um, essentially a withholding of, parliament of parliamentary processes in order to have an, uh, um, an effective policy, Turkey. Um, so we need to preserve the democratic legitimacy, the democratic foundations of the polity, but um, we need to enforce legitimacy with a new aspect of uh, science-based politics, a new deliberative aspect. We need to take decisions to reason. Um, and I think people are very ready to just address uh, these new issues in uh, democratic um, governments. I think this new model um, will um, stay here as a new but important aspect of uh, our current democracy. Thank you, George, very much. Um, Amy, experts are back in fashion. Are they going to stay back in fashion? It's interesting, Kevin, because when we first met, you mentioned that we're, we go back a long time. I uh, had a, a serious interest in uh, the role of expertise in monetary policy. And I follow that obviously along uh, all these years, but it, it does remind me a bit of what we used to think about the role of expertise in central banking, as if a, a central bank would know exactly what the level of price stability would be, and therefore politics would have nothing to do with it. And we've learned over the years that if you have very clear preferences, that that's a, a reasonable thing to do. If it's a, a black and white, you want low inflation, then you can set it to a central bank and make it. And you have very clear standards to see whether you made, made those inflation rates. Now, on a, on a COVID crisis, when the, when the crisis is immediate and you want to reduce the number of people who are being uh, affected by COVID and, and you want to flatten the curve, for, for the immediate run, especially those countries who have insufficient capacities in their hospitals and are worried about having to triage which patient is going to be treated and who is not, because if they're in hospital, they may still survive, but if not, they're going to die. Uh, there is almost the same urgency. So it, it focuses the mind and to the surprise of many people, the citizens in, in many of these countries were willing to comply in the short run, 
it did mean in a number of countries that uh, lots of people lost their jobs and maybe they're able to survive for some time at home without a job that requires that you go outdoors. But there comes a point where the actual triaging of who might be ill or not and people starving because they have no food uh, becomes no more, uh, no, no much, not as much a, a black and white issue where you could decide on a certain percentage, but where you have to make real trade offs about whose livelihood is more important than somebody else's livelihood. Now, in the immediate crisis, that seems to have been uh, put to the side. And a lot of these advanced economies had sufficiently strong governments with sufficiently strong budgets and, and possibly the help of the EU down the road to help them out in that immediate crisis. But there will come this very difficult moment where the economic crisis that is coming up, where the answers may not be so black and white, where very difficult questions will have to be made that are profoundly political. Are we going to tax everybody a lot and then give a base income to everybody, see that we've destroyed the economy in, to ensure that we didn't have a lot of deaths or not more deaths than we have today? And of course, there is a profound difference between the young and the old. This particular pandemic hits those people 50 and up much more severely than it does those under 50. And those between 20 and zero, in fact, or between 18 and zero can't vote. And they are not particularly informed about the very strong uh, uh, correlations between uh, reducing our economic activity and how that might affect some people in, in, um, in precarious work. So it, it, there comes a point where, in fact, even though we are relying on experts, and I think that that has been a wonderful thing, uh, the, 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 the larger societal issues, I fear are quite complicated and require at the end of the day, a political decision. So we're, we're, the role of experts in many of these countries recently have been predominantly uh, people who are, are experts in the virus and how the virus will spread and what it will do if you're like a meter and a half, two meters, or you know what kind of surface and, and what does it spread over the air? And if you've been infected and you have uh, protection, will you be protected again? These kinds of questions, which are incredibly important. But th this next level of problems that, 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 that the COVID lockdown in various forms has, has led to, uh, I think is something that will, will require, if we are going to go along the lines of, of experts, we will need to include people who are representing the economics discipline, political scientists, sociologists, educational experts, so that we, we, we think about the cost to society of having these particular measures and what happens down the road. Thanks, Amy, very much. Uh, let's go to some of the questions which are coming in, which are great questions, and pick up some of the themes that have just been uh, mentioned. We have uh, Victoria from um, Oklahoma uh, watching us, and she asked the question, uh, what can the EU do about member states uh, that have responded to the crisis in ways that actually decrease democratic deliberation? What should the EU do uh, in uh, such cases? And you've both written very profoundly about uh, governance at the European Union uh, level. But I wonder um, what you think the European Union uh, should do when we have the mother of all crises, when some EU member states seem to uh, be shifting away from established democratic processes, democratic norms, uh, etc. Should we just tolerate that and, and uh, wait for a better uh, tomorrow, wait for things to come right next time? Or should the European Union act in order to uphold certain democratic norms across our member states? Uh, George, do you want to um, comment on that? No, that's, that's not a very difficult question when it um... It is addressed to a constitutional lawyer. Um, by all means, we need to preserve democracy on, a EU on an EU level. Um, I think um, from one viewpoint, the, 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 the pandemic um, has also been a, a motive for some to take advantage and profit from this in order to establish a more authoritarian process of decision making in their respective countries. Um, it, it, it is indeed, uh, it comes as a collateral to the uh, crisis that the power 
uh, converges to a certain um, core of, of uh, government. Um, so it, it is always a danger. Yet I think the European Union has the institutional tools to actually address this pathology. Uh, we all know that there has been an initiation of the rule of law process um, of Article 7 of the uh, treaty in order to address some issues of um, intervention of, of, of the executive to the uh, judiciary. Um, this sort of democratic deterioration cannot be tolerated uh, in Europe. Uh, in Europe, we do have two uh, fundamental keys, uh, which are, in fact, the, the uh, most important layer of protection for, for the European citizens. First, uh, it is democracy. Uh, we do respect democracy and we know how to address issues uh, of authoritarian uh, regimes. And the second is that we place the humans in the forefront of, of uh, any policy making. This is uh, our motto. And I think uh, we need to preserve both of, of uh, these mainstays. Uh, if you ask me, the um, recent events in, in certain countries, uh, also including uh, Poland, where we had the elections with um, some uh, constitutional aspects uh, concerning the accumulation of power. Um, I think the uh, European Union must be much more interventionist when it comes to the democratic foundations of, of uh, the Union. Um, and I think the uh, Union needs to trigger the institutional vehicles in order to safeguard the critical mass of, of uh, democratic processes um, and the rule of law. We need to understand that um, solidarity and sustain sustainability are both extremely important for the well being of the Union, but uh, we cannot survive without uh, democracy and the rule of law. And I feel that uh, most of the European people um, would be very um, uh, willing to accept a more interventionist role of the European Union in this respect. Thank you, George, very much indeed. Uh, Amy, I wonder if we could link that question to a second, which is from uh, Iva in Bulgaria. Uh, what conditions should or can the European Union attach to financial support from its putative recovery fund uh, when helping states with higher corruption levels in order to ensure that aid is not misused or misplaced. So there's two questions uh, for you here. I wonder if you could link them for us, please. Yes, well, thank you very much for the questions. Uh, so uh, following up on the last question, I won't repeat what George said, but one of the things that I often wondered about is when we were going through the uh, process of uh, uh, writing the um, constitutional treaty for the EU, there were a lot of uh, experiments with speaking to citizens through focus groups and, and workshops and, uh, and reaching out to what people felt. And uh, that was a, a whole period that led to a document that eventually was uh, put to the side, but parts of it became the Lisbon Treaty. But this process of reaching out to citizens is something that we may be able to uh, do again. Uh, in, in particular because of what I mentioned at the very beginning of my, my talk, that we would like citizens to feel that the EU is there for them and to kind of reintroduce some of these ways to listen to the citizens may very well be wise at this point. Now, one of our citizens from Bulgaria, in a sense, is asking us such a question. And if I were to speak on behalf of those who study the EU and think about how the EU can play a role in this regard, I would say that one of the discussion points that we have on the table now in uh, the next two weeks a decision will be made is under what conditions will the EU be willing to fund the member states and the debate on the table is exactly that should grants be made available that don't have to be paid back. Uh, but then the question still remains, how do we double check that those grants have been spent well, or do we put in place loans that are gonna be given and have to be paid back. And again, the question becomes, will there be any strings attached? Will there be a requirement for member states 
to improve, for example, on how they generate their own income? Or, you know, are they going to do something about restructuring their economy, which is usually a way of saying cutting on some of the expenses or being able to draw in more tax money? Now, these things are uh, not only exactly the same as corruption. It is the question of whether the EU would be able to have some say over which part of the uh, public finances of a state are not working so well. I think the EU is going to position itself that they will have some say about this, uh, because if we connect it up with the comment uh, that George made about Poland and Hungary, uh, there's a lot of uh, concern that maybe the Hungarian government has taken from the EU uh, structural funds uh, monies for their own uh, enrichment. Uh, to put it this way, and that uh, the EU effectively has been funding a government that has turned around and then not uh, uh, respected the rule of law as per the EU principles. So I think this is a very important point that needs to be in such a package that we are absolutely sure that the citizens can be uh, rest assured that the money is not going to go in the hands of those who didn't deserve it. Can I make an additional comment, Kevin? Of course. Um, I totally agree with what Amy said. I just want to add two uh, small comments. The first is that we uh, obviously need to have a double conditionality on the um, next EU uh, recovery fund. Um, I think the first conditionality should be uh, the, um, the treatment of, of, of the fund in a way that secures um, an open government, transparency, and good use of, of uh, public funds. On the other hand, uh, for me, it's very important that these specific uh, funds are used not only um, in support of, of the current generation, but also uh, for the use of, of uh, the future generations. The truth is that we are in a very critical moment. Uh, we need to consider the future uh, generations, the social sustainability uh, for the future. Uh, we need to address issues uh, that um, will be very akin in the near future. Um, obviously, uh, everybody admits that uh, our generations uh, have made an overconsumption of, of uh, natural resources or of uh, other um, sources. Um, at, at, at this time, I strongly feel that we need to envisage the future um, and try to establish all sorts of structural reforms in order to secure, to secure a more ecological uh, future for the next generations, um, uh, a future that would secure uh, combat of, of, of uh, inequalities, um, combat of, of uh, poverty, very basic key principles that need to be uh, addressed alongside with the uh, financial stability of uh, the states. The second comment uh, has to do uh, with the uh, central health policy of the uh, European Union. Um, the funds uh, and the way uh, these funds are going to be treated by the member states is important, uh, but also we need to consider the, um, the medical uh, aspects of the situation. We need to make sure that within the European Union, we do have the mechanism in order to have a line of production for the vaccines, for the medicines in order to combat the uh, virus. This is of acute importance for uh, Europe. Uh, at this moment, there is um, a war, uh, an entrepreneurial war, uh, among the uh, medical enterprises and the industries in order to uh, get the IPs of, of um, the new vaccines and treatments. Um, this war uh, needs to uh, address social issues. Uh, Europe needs to operate unanimously on this. We need to secure that uh, we produce uh, Europe-wide um, those vaccines and medicines at, at uh, relatively low cost and that all people are guaranteed access to um, uh, these vaccines. This can only be made through a centralized initiative.
the European Union, I am afraid that no state um, can individually uh, treat this uh, problem, and I think this should be set highly on, on the European agenda. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much indeed. Uh, there's a question here which is specifically on Greece, so if I could uh, invite George to comment. This is from Dimitris in Greece. We know that the services sector of the economy is likely to suffer sustained losses over the next five years. What does that mean for the Greek government's economic strategy during the current electoral cycle? What will fuel Greece's recovery? Um, this would need at least half, half an hour more, Kevin. So um, we I'll, could, I'll give you two minutes. We, we could just organize another meeting concerning the financial recovery of Greece. The truth is, as Dimitri said, that um, Greece uh, has an over-reliance factor upon um, uh, the services uh, actor of the uh, economy. Unfortunately, throughout the last decades, there has been a transformation of the economy from the uh, production to the services. And now we're absolutely uh, reliant upon the, um, the touristic interest industry. Uh, and of course, that makes the Greek economy very vulnerable to events such as the pandemic. Uh, now, um, coming back to this, the Greek government has tried to um, secure all possible funds uh, for the touristic industry. We have secured that um, the labor force remains within the touristic industry. Greece was, I think, the only country throughout Europe uh, that made a very innovative policy to uh, actually uh, give motives to all enterprises in order not to release uh, their uh, labor. Um, and indeed, we didn't have any dismissals from uh, uh, industries, um, no redundancies uh, from existing industries. I think we have done relatively well yet. Uh, the problem is yet to come. Um, as of tomorrow, uh, tourism is open again. We expect that we're going to have uh, a 20 to 25 percent of the income coming from tourism in relation to uh, the last few years. So uh, we definitely suffer a loss of uh, 70 percent or more of the uh, national income. We're prepared for, for this, um, and we really rely upon the uh, next EU funds as well. Uh, but I think uh, this is the moment to actually start discussing about changing the actual mixture of uh, the Greek economy structurally, uh, just to revisit the situation to see whether we should just orient the uh, resources towards another model of um, economy in Greece. Um, I think we should definitely make an effort to try and moderate reliance upon the uh, services. Um, the, the government has uh, decided to uh, address this issue and we have mandated uh, a committee of experts which is led by uh, Nobel laureate uh, Pisaridis uh, to come up with uh, a new financial scheme for the country um, now that we expect to have adequate funds in order to reorganize structurally the Greek economy. And we're very positive that uh, by mid-October, and I say mid-October because this is the deadline to submit um, the uh, national proposals for the uh, recovery fund, uh, we will have an overall holistic strategy concerning the Greek economy in order not only to make uh, people more comfortable with uh, uh, financial destinies, but also to intervene uh, in a more productive and long-term way in the Greek economy and actually change the orientation uh, towards a more uh, reliable and viable uh, mixture of economy. Thank you very much. Let me take the opportunity to saying that uh, Professor Christopher Pissarides is not only a Nobel Prize winner in economics, he's also a professor at the London School of Economics. Um, there's a question specifically on the Netherlands, uh, Amy. Uh, 
How has the Netherlands responded to solidarity in the European Union in the context of the recovery fund? There, I'm muting. Okay, so um, the the whole matter around solidarity uh, got off on a bit of an awkward start. The, the Netherlands as such uh, felt solidarity to other member states, particularly those who were heavily affected in the early stage. But when those first discussions were uh, being held about euro bonds, the way the Dutch uh, Minister of Finance and uh, the Prime Minister uh, discussed these matters in the European context uh, did not receive the, uh, the uh, welcome that they had expected. In other words, the, 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 the emphasis on uh, uh, making sure that the rules would be proper down the road uh, got more attention than the need to uh, express solidarity. And the uh, finance minister came home and said that he made a mistake in terms of his wording. I think the, the Netherlands has, from the very beginning, felt the need to be uh, a strong supporter of European integration and the solidarity to member states in need. But they've also wanted to play uh, the, the role of the member state that would be uh, sounding a bit more uh, conservative uh, tone with regard to uh, spending EU funds to, uh, to member states. So solidarity as such isn't really the point that has been uh, compromised, but the, the circumstances, circumstances under which the Netherlands would want to uh, support uh, transfer funds. Now, some of this may be um, difficult to understand if you're not uh, looking at Dutch politics, the internal uh, domestic circumstances that are taking place. Uh, so the leading uh, coalition party, uh, the, are the VVD, these are conservative uh, liberals uh, who have been uh, trying to fend off the um, possible voters to the right of this party that could be more Eurosceptic. And so to ensure that the voters aren't massively going to go for another party expressing very Eurosceptic views, the, 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 the coalition parties have been uh, on a platform for some time of being prudent and careful. Elections are coming up uh, next spring. And it is important for these parties to signal to the voters that they're careful with, with the money of the, of, the, uh, of the Dutch citizen. The Dutch are also per capita paying more than others. Uh, in my opinion, it's, it's a very small uh, price to pay for a country that is benefiting from so much trade and international uh, mobility and services and, uh, and, and international activities. So that the per capita payment is really not a very important indicator. But because it's been framed that way, uh, the government finds itself in the position that if more money is going to go to Europe, they need to signal that they've been very careful in how that money is being spent. Thank you. There's a couple of questions about the social inequalities that are arising from the impact of the pandemic. Uh, Amy had mentioned before in terms of the impact on the, the disproportionate impact on the elderly. Uh, I wonder in that context, whether you think this is transformative in how governments respond to the needs of different demographics, different age groups, uh, et cetera. Amy had mentioned that the young are less uh, affected, less likely to be infected by the uh, coronavirus. Uh, and George has mentioned about the need to remodel our economies for future generations. I wonder whether the impact of the pandemic, at least in the short to medium term, is actually to create more confusion, more confusion in terms of uh, the distribution of resources to better protect the elderly who are the most vulnerable in the, in the crisis, uh, but also at the same time, wondering about how to uh, serve the interests of, of the future, future generations. I wonder, Amy, if we could come back to you and start in reverse order, please. Yeah, I think this is a very difficult question. If you think about this as an EU problem, we're back to the EU not having competence in this area. It's a big redistribution question, and the EU's budget is relatively small. It's 1% of all of the money that, we, that the EU collectively makes. So it's a very small budget to redistribute. Uh, 
of course, there are already social funds and unemployment funds that can be used for uh, EU distribution. And some of that can be uh, redirected towards the needs of, of youth for, for, for long-term uh, employment. But most of these initiatives will remain national. And so one would need to focus either on coordination of member states, trying to encourage each of these member states to do this if it, if, if, insofar as the EU is concerned. But most, most of it need not be encouraged by the EU because member states in fact have already stepped up to the plate and said, again, connecting back to what I said before, that strong government, a lot of public uh, support is what we are seeing, in, at least in this immediate uh, start of the, of the COVID crisis and before we see the watershed of economic recession we are expecting uh, to happen. So what do member states then possibly potentially do. I think there's a real challenge here because the, the lockdown and the need to continue with social distancing and uh, working at home and studying at home uh, may have a, a severe impact on, on young people. And we're not clear how this impacts. And I think our, our colleague George was talking about the digitization of Greece. And I was, I was amazed and, and, and wondering uh, the details of this, uh, in particular, insofar as, as education for children is concerned, because these, these children are at home being uh, together with their parents who are also having to try to work insofar as they're able to do that. And it's very difficult for, for youth to be able to remain focused and motivated, particularly with educators who haven't had the training to be suddenly a distance educator. Uh, the, the high schools, middle schools and high schools, this is also very pertinent because they're in an age group where they really need each other and they're not particularly likely wanting to reach out to their parents for guidance and support. Traditionally, this group is trying to, uh, if you like, stand up and be different from their parents. So they're missing their friends, they, they're in a context of their parents and with, with teachers who are doing the best they can, but they're only to some extent trained. So I think the, the notion of what do we do with youth up until, let's say, 26 is something that we really could do well with uh, further thinking about this, uh, providing best practices and maybe sharing some of these ideas about how best to deal with this if there's another wave and more lockdown and so on coming down the road because this is entirely possible. And we don't really want a generation to have uh, uh, lost opportunities, not just for formal training, but also the interaction with peers and at this very, uh, very difficult time in their in their development. Thank you, George. Um, Amy is absolutely right in in, in uh, stressing the point. Um, I think the pandemic has raised uh, very forcefully the uh, issue of the uh, diverse influence upon various subgroups of any type of of uh, crisis, um, which eventually, as a collateral effect raises the uh, inequalities. Uh, the truth is that a lot of social sub subgroups are, are, are hugely, immensely affected uh, by the pandemic, not directly as a health issue, but collaterally as a social and financial issue. Um, and for example, one might say about the vulnerables or uh, the minorities, or in the case of Greece for the immigrants or uh, refugees. Um, which is a huge issue in uh, Greece. On the other hand, what happens is um, that I, I can see that there is um, a tremendous influence upon the uh, younger generations. Um, I can tell you a story about how decisions were taken in, uh, in Greece when it came um, to decide, and that was a very difficult decision to make, whether to reopen schools um, after um, a couple of months of, of uh, um, shutdown of, of uh, uh, primary and secondary uh, schools. Uh, the truth is that uh, there was a very wide anxiety uh, from the society at large uh, because uh, especially parents were uh, absolutely uh, skeptical uh, whether this should be of any use uh, since it only made less than a month of, of uh, the school period, um, the um, actual added value from an educational point of view wouldn't be tremendous, uh, the truth is. And further, um, there was uh, an increasing concern because uh, in Greece, uh, we do have the phenomenon that um, 
there are strong family liaisons and in the uh, family homes, more often than not, there are elderly as well, grandparents um, or parents of, of, of uh, senior age. So um, there was a danger concerning the uh, transmission of uh, the disease. Uh, so we had to make a, a very difficult uh, decision um, against which there, there was a very strong social sentiment. Um, eventually what happened was that we decided to reopen schools uh, and the decision was not only made uh, because of uh, the data concerning the uh, coronavirus, but uh, mostly on social grounds, not even educational grounds, because we decided to reopen schools um, uh, on a day uh, after day basis. So essentially children went to school every other day uh, in order to cut into half the actual schooling environment. Uh, the major reason why we decided to open schools was because we um, saw that uh, there was an emerging gap uh, concerning the quality of education uh, provided to uh, the youngsters because um, as you can imagine, uh, there was a huge variation uh, in school uh, concerning the uh, distant and digital learning. Um, some schools, mostly the private schools with adequate financial resources introduced very high tech systems of distant learning uh, through which um, children could um, uh, pile up their knowledge and go on with uh, their syllabus. Whereas on some occasions in, in uh, public schools um, or in schools where internet was not as strong or where technology has not arrived to a large extent, uh, we did encounter incidents of a low participation to distant learning. So the situation was that there was an, an emerging uh, social inequality um, we thought that this was uh, unacceptable and we had to take the risk to reopen schools um, in order to mitigate um, this phenomenon. But the truth is uh, that uh, the more the pandemic goes on, uh, all the collaterals contribute negatively uh, to uh, social inequalities and we need to come up with a cohesive strategy in order to reverse uh, this trend in all ages and in, lo in all layers of society. Thank you very much. We're going to run out of time. So, I, and I can see before me many questions, and I know I'm going to be criticised for not selecting uh, so many uh, of these. Um, there's a question here from Keith uh, Raffan, who is a former member of Parliament uh, in the UK. And it's, uh, I think it can be to, to both of you, uh, but it's uh, addressed, uh, first of all, to uh, George. Quote, in view of Greece's successful handling of the pandemic, where, in your personal opinion, do you think that the British government went wrong? Uh, if you could just answer in about one minute, both of you, please. Um, to tell you the truth, I have the feeling that the Greek government underestimated the um, actual danger posed by the uh, pandemic. Um, I think uh, mostly it relied on a political uh, choice that uh, life, uh, both in terms of society and in terms of the market, has to uh, go on. Um, and this is why there was a delay in taking some uh, radical decisions. So. Um, yeah. The truth is that yeah, in Greece, uh, we never questioned the uh, dominance of, of uh, human life. So this was something that uh, was not negotiable. Um, so for, from a very early stage, okay. we took this um, responsibility and we were accountable to this. Thank you. Amy, yes. I wonder if you want to... I, I think the United Kingdom was also uh, a little bit unlucky in that when they realized that these uh, strategies uh, about um, 
sort of herd immunity were not uh, working as well as some had uh, anticipated or that they thought that that could be acceptable. It took a bit of time to make those those decisions. Of course, we you had a prime minister who was also in hospital for, for this. So it, it led also at a bit of a slowness at the top. Um, I, it's, it's easy to say in hindsight, you know, somebody was wrong, another bit person was right. Uh, the, the strategies that were before governments were very difficult and often it meant a quick either U-turn or adjustment, and then trying to convince the citizens that they will need to take all these steps and to make sure you find the strategy for your citizens to do what you think is recommendable sometimes takes a little bit longer. I think the UK also had a lot of people who, who just needed a bit more time to adjust to the fact that this was going to dramatically change uh, what they were all about. And the UK has had a really hard time. I mean, very few people uh, will, will deny uh, that the Brits had probably the, the hardest political three years going into this crisis as far as Britain is concerned. Greece had its own hard time, but it was just a few years before. So I would I would say to some extent, uh, the UK was also a little bit unlucky uh, having to deal with this at this time. We were very well, very well trained to this, Kevin. Because we had <laughs> of, of financial mistreats, so apparently we were very well practiced for this. <laughs> oh, I, I, yes, I, I take that. that. That's a serious point, uh, indeed. I was just about to be more uh, humorous by finishing with Amy's generosity that the British have been very unlucky. Let me point out that outside, I'm watching here pouring rain as well. We know what unlucky is when it comes to weather in the UK. Um, but your final comments have actually underscored uh, one of the other uh, points which one of our participants mentioned that there isn't the science there's a question of interpreting different types of scientific uh, evidence behavioral epidemiology uh, etc and the job of government is to try to reconcile conflicting uh, advice so let me first of all um, thank all of our participants uh, for your questions and again, I apologize uh, for not being able to take more of them. They were coming thick and fast from many different uh, countries, and I uh, appreciate that. But all your, also your questions are testimony to the quality of the comments and the insights that we've had from our two distinguished uh, professors, uh, Jorgos Jere Petritis and Professor Amy Verdun from Leiden University in the Netherlands. I, I, I uh, regret that uh, Bo Rothstein wasn't able to stay with us for technical reasons. I'm sure uh, we can invite him on a future occasion. But for now, for the Zoom, uh, thank you for joining us for this uh, COVID-19 LSE uh, program. Uh, you can find more information about the COVID-19 events of the LSE on our websites. And in particular, you can also find more information about the events on Greece. Uh, through the Hellenic Observatory website at the LSE. I can see a number of people have asked questions uh, from Greece, so there must be uh, a lot of interest in the Hellenic Observatory also. So to all of you, thank you for joining us, and we hope you can join us on a future occasion. Many thanks indeed. Goodbye. <laughs>